Pokemon is a game known for its wide array of options. Whether you're a fan of cutesy Pokemon like Jigglypuff or strong menacing ones like Roaring Moon, this franchise has over the years made so many unique Pokemon that you can pretty much always find one to attach yourself to. Despite how many options we've had for both games and Pokemon to choose from though, there are some that typically we can't even use until the very end of our journeys. So today, I'm going to shine a spotlight on these mines, the top 10 best Pokemon to end your adventure with. These Pokemon will all be the options that I feel are the strongest ones for the later portions of your adventure while also typically being unobtainable for the majority of your playthrough. While I will need to acknowledge some rare cases where you can use certain entries here very early on, those encounters are typically few and far between. Also, before we begin, I have a new series over on Myst Magius where I'm doing a Pokemon Heart Gold Randomizer Hardcore Nuzlocke. It's been pretty interesting so far, so if you guys enjoyed those kinds of challenges, be sure to go subscribe to Myst Magius. Anywho though, let's begin. Starting off today's list is a Pokemon with mixed availability as of recently but historically has been a late game Pokemon due to most regions requiring the use of a super rod to encounter it. Coming in, we have Milotic, which might arguably be one of the best late game water types available. A pure water typing only has weaknesses to grass and electric, which while both have some presence in the later portions of the story, they're not typically common outside of your rival's team and maybe a single gym. This means Milotic can be useful against most games later gyms, which typically feature some ground type boss, as well as a generally strong neutral Pokemon as well into most other opponents. If you're wondering what Milotic does against water resistances, Ice Beam and Dragon Pulse are usually level up moves for Milotic that allow it the ability to harm late game dragon types, as well as some form of super effective or at least neutral damage against grass types. Milotic has a couple things holding it back though from being any higher on the list, which mainly comes in form of its damage output. While I don't act like Milotic is weak, it's the only top option that's not a wall breaker or at least capable of offensive setup. Your best setup would be Coil, which typically isn't going to benefit you in an in-game journey due to it mostly being used for the accuracy buff to benefit moves like Hypnosis and Muddy Water in competitive. Milotic doesn't really have any other glaring weaknesses though, since it shines in every other facet. Your move pool might be limited, but it covers every important area. Your abilities might be niche, but Marvel Skill and Competitive are both game changing if they're activated, and Marvel Skill can technically even be self activated with a Flame Orb if you really wanted the defense buff. It's not impossible to make Milotic into a monster, but it does take a bit of planning compared to other entries on this list, which are pretty much inherently just monsters from the start. Coming up next on our list, we have one of our handful of entries you can get in the early game here and there, but typically is more of a late game entry. With Lucario coming in at number 9, the list already starts off with an incredibly monstrous Pokemon offensively. With 110 attack and 115 special attack, Lucario is a Pokemon that manages to break through a majority of games it's featured in due to its strong stab of fighting, which is already an incredible offensive typing. But in later games, its steel typing is the true reason Lucario can shine. With a stab to handle your fairy weaknesses, while also no longer being weak to psychic types like most other fighting type Pokemon would be, this turns Lucario into an offensive monster for most opponents. You can give it moves such as Extreme Speed, Ice Punch, Rock Slide, and a wide array of other options in order to overcome otherwise impossible matchups. Lucario's probably like the late game equivalent of using a Nidoking or Gardevoir on your team, where your best way of using this Pokemon would be by adding strong TMs to it in order to ensure you'll always have a positive offensive matchup. Lucario at least offers a strong offensive fighting type for you to consider in the later portion of your journey, and is a fairly unique late game Pokemon in terms of its roles it would provide for your team, landing it at a strong place at number 9 today. Going into our 8th best Pokemon today, we have a pretty high jump from Lucario all the way to Volcarona. 
Volcarona contends as one of the strongest Univan Pokemon, and even ignoring the competitive aspect, Volcarona rivals even some of the strongest pseudo-legendaries in history. Despite having only a 550 base stat total, Volcarona has the power to absolutely run away with most matches in the late game. With access to moves like Quiver Dance, Morning Sun, and many other special options, Volcarona has very little effort outplaying most enemies. Volcarona has the Fire and Bug type, which does give a few key weaknesses to its typing, like Water, Flying, and especially Rock. However, while not every one of these will be relevant in the later story, a lot of modern games have some sort of rock types on their teams, such as Diantha having the fossils from Kalos and Olivia's entire team in the Gen 7 games. Despite this, Volcarona can learn Giga Drain in order to combat its weaknesses, due to how slow most rock types are. Now, you might be asking, is Volcarona even available in these games for the end game? And the answer is it's actually more common than you'd think. In modern games, you can usually find Larvesta in the mid-late game, but even as early as Generation 5, you can still use Volcarona for your Elite Four run. For example, in Pokemon Black and White, you can actually get a Larvesta egg after obtaining Surf and going down Route 17 and 18 to get the egg for it. Once Volcarona gets its good Fire Stab though, is when it turns into a horrid menace for any in-game run. The timing of when you actually get to use some of these fire moves, like in Pokemon Sun and Moon for instance with the Mover Learner, is what makes it an incredibly threatening late game mine. It's just, with some of those games, either you have decent fire stab on Volcarona right away, or you have to wait a bit. It's very mixed as to when Volcarona actually gets going, because each game is different for Volcarona in terms of when and where it actually gets good fire stab and not to mention its evolution. It's stuck with Ember the vast majority of the time you have it, but in games like Pokemon Black and White 2 for instance, Incinerate is available for it using battle points at the Pokemon World Tournament, or the Battle Subway. Or you can go the Heat Wave route and move Tutor it in Humalau City for 10 Yellow Shards via the Tutor. Not to mention you also can get Volcarona earlier in these set of games. Fire Blast is also an option if you're fine with only 5 power points. It just depends on what you're okay with as a player and what you want to tolerate in terms of putting moves on it. Regardless, I can't dismiss the fact that it's an incredible Pokemon. And that's why it's here. Our number 7 entry might be a bit controversial. Not for the skill, but rather if this even counts for a late game encounter at all. But I found the distribution quite split down the middle, so I decided it at least did not not fit on our list. The Pokemon taking up our number 7 spot today though is a generation 1 titan and historically one of the few Pokemon to just always be strong on your journey regardless of the game, Snorlax. Snorlax has a lot of strong benefits in this story, starting off with its one weakness to fighting. For a Pokemon that has so much bulk, having a weakness to only a single type definitely helps, since this typically means you'll maybe struggle with one or two bosses, if any, during your journey. When you combine that with the amazing coverage Snorlax gets by virtue of being a normal type, and the setup options you'll typically learn such as Curse and Amnesia, it's no wonder to see how Snorlax can be useful on your journey. Snorlax even has multiple abilities that will benefit you, such as Gluttony, Thick Fat, and Immunity. While they're all somewhat niche abilities, they all benefit Snorlax's ability to set up and defeat any trainers you'd happen to fight, giving these abilities a much better place on Snorlax as opposed to how Thick Fat fares on something like Walrein. The main reason why Snorlax is here though is due to how well it can fit on any team if you're lacking power or bulk. There is a reason why you see Snorlax on a lot of my best teams, and that's because I value it so highly. Maybe it's just my personal bias, but Snorlax has come in clutch for me time and time again that I couldn't not put it on this list. When you think of pseudo-legendaries, one of the most iconic ones is probably our number 6 entry, Tyranitar. 
Tyranitar historically has been one of the strongest pseudo legendaries in competitive, but the end game is another story. With the plethora of late game fighting and ground type bosses, Tyranitar faces some steep competition when compared to other entries on our list today. It's probably one of the only Pokemon that arguably would actually have a negative matchup into most opponents you'd face in the story's later portions. But despite all of this, why does Tyranitar manage to make the list and why did I give it number six on my rankings today? Well, for starters, Tyranitar is easily one of the bulkiest offensive options in game. The ability Sandstream, in tandem with its rock typing, allows Tyranitar to be one of the best special sponges in competitive, which is amazing for matchups against Psychic and Ghost type Pokemon. A lot of the strongest options you'd fight in the late game are one of these two types. So being a dark type already has a lot of merit here, and this special defense boost from the sand only helps. Tyranitar also has a phenomenal coverage set, both on the physical and special side. With options like Ice, Fire, Electric, Ground, and Fighting, and many other types being covered with both physical and special options, Tyranitar can easily be tailored to save any bad matchup you'd have otherwise found yourself wrapped up in. Tyranitar is probably one of the most unique pseudo-legendaries in the games with most other pseudo-legends either being fairly underwhelming, like Gudra, or being pretty offensively focused without a lot of bulk behind them. If you avoid strong fighting and ground types though, Tyranitar can easily run away with a lot of your late game opponents. One of the most terrifying dragons in all of competitive has easily been Salamence, our number five entry. Whether it's the pre-evolution or it's Megaform, I can't imagine that most of you aren't aware of how broken Salamence truly is as a dragon type. I do want to start by mentioning, Salamence is available in the very early part in Generation 7 due to the SOS feature. There's a lot of strong late game options available with this feature, and Salamence is by far the most noteworthy among these early options since you can obtain Salamence as a level 12 on Route 3 through this. Despite this one rare exception though, Salamence is still almost exclusively a late game mon however, so I am counting it on our list today. Salamence has an incredible ability, Intimidate, which allows it to switch around physical threats in order to weaken opponent's damage against it. This allows Salamence an easier time to break past most in-game Pokemon, and with the strong stab pairing of Dragon and Flying, Salamence can easily break most enemies. With coverage for steals, with moves like Earthquake and Fire Blast, you can easily tailor Salamence into the perfect mixed attacker to blow past most of your enemies. Salamence can also just set up with Dragon Dance on Pokemon that can't break you, before becoming impossible to not only outspeed, but also impossible to survive a single attack from. While there is plenty of strong pseudo dragons, Salamence remains one of your best choices for the late game portions of these games. Our number four entry is probably the hardest to obtain among every entry on our list. In fact, I almost considered not including it due to how few games you can even obtain it in aren't until you've beaten the Elite Four. However, coming in at number four is one of the strongest steel types to ever exist and arguably the Pokemon that pioneered the type to its greatness, Metagross. Metagross is truly a rags to riches story with one of the worst base stages to ever exist that suddenly becomes a true offensive and defensive nightmare. Metagross was so good in fact, they had to nerf Steel's resistance in order to give it a weakness to Ghost and Dark in future generations due to how difficult it was to knock out. Even with this nerf, Metagross will still easily be one of your strongest Pokemon in regions it is available in. Metagross has plenty going for it in terms of its moves, with a fairly wide array of options like Earthquake, Zen Headbutt, Meteor Mash, Bullet Punch, and many other options at its disposal. It's pretty shocking how Beldum, with just Takedown, turns into a Pokemon that's known for having such a perfectly tailored learn set that allows Metagross an easy time getting past counterplay. The biggest issue you'll have with using Metagross is finding one. 
since you'll only be able to access it in Black and White 2 and the Gen 7 games. Both games, though, will greatly appreciate having a strong steel type in the later portions, and having a psychic in Generation 5 that won't be weak to Grimsley will also be game-changing. Metagross, in my eyes, sets the precedent going forward for just how outlandish some of these Pokemon go, and truthfully, is mostly ranked as low as it is, since compared to its similarly viable counterparts, it's just so scarcely available. Hopefully, that might change in the Indigo Disc DLC, since if it's anything like the Teal Mask, we might be able to find one to use before the Elite Four when replaying the game. When making my list today, I tried to avoid using Paldean Pokemon as much as possible due to the fact that when I'm comparing most of the strongest late game options, every other entry I considered has a similar level of notoriety across multiple entries. However, our number three entry, King Gambit, is a different breed. Compared to every other Paldean Pokemon, King Gambit already has a fairly noteworthy partner in Bisharp, which is already a strong endgame contender. While I think Bisharp may have just barely missed our list today, King Gambit gives this strong late game contender a much needed evolution to keep up with our power creep in recent generations. Either option on their own will provide you a strong darkened steel type, which at face value, you might wonder, Mystic, another dark type that's weak to ground with a four times weakness to fighting? What makes King Gambit so good? Well, I'm getting to that. King Gambit, and even Bisharp, has a few key benefits over a mon like Tyranitar. Despite having a worse coverage set than Tyranitar, King Gambit makes up for this with the addition of Sucker Punch and Kotal Cleave. Sucker Punch allows you to handle even fast Psychic and Ghost types using moves like Focus Blast to KO you first. Whereas Kotal Cleave, you can pretty much mow down anything you want, considering it's a move with flawless accuracy. This allows King Gambit a strong ability to set up with moves like Swords Dance Turn 1 in order to use Sucker Punch or Kotal Cleave freely until you win in most cases. But if you have fallen teammates, you don't even need Swords Dance when Supreme Overlord exists. You also have a strong Steel Typing, which just benefits Dark better defensively. With a stab that checks fairies, King Gambit is one of the few Dark types not hurt by this new typing in modern generations. While it is too soon to call how valuable King Gambit will be in terms of breaking through teams in the late game, Bisharp already has been such a powerful late game option in every generation it's included in, that I'd be shocked if Bisharp suddenly flopped in future games after how good it was in Scarlet and Violet, despite the end game boss fights against Air from Team Star and Rika from the Elite Four. Even if King Gambit is bad in future installments, I'm sure Eviolite Bisharp will thrive very easily considering it's already a menace without the added bulk. While we've had plenty of pseudos on today's list, today's runner-up Pokemon is probably one of the weakest if we're talking from solely base stats. We got Mamoswine, which has most of its benefits coming from its typing of ice and ground. Seeing a Pokemon that only has a 530 base stat total being the lowest base stat total on our list today reach number two, while also being an ice type, might actually surprise some of you guys at first, until we take into account how well it pairs with the ground typing. This type combination allows Mamoswine to cover weaknesses to fire, rock, and steel that the ice typing would otherwise possess. The ice typing also benefits Mamoswine's ground typing as well, giving access to coverage for grass types that otherwise harm you, as well as for opposing ground types and even flying Pokemon, which would typically be the best way to check a ground type due to their immunity. This stab combination makes Mamoswine typically one of the most lethal physical breakers in the game, and something that, without a bulky water type, most enemies will struggle to check. Mamoswine does have a few things that, when compared to our number one entry, does hold it back a bit, with the first being its abilities. Its abilities don't exactly hold it back, but you're rarely taking advantage of Snowcloak and Oblivious in-game and Thick Fat 
while useful, is only helpful against two types that are rather uncommon in most regions. The other big factor is Mammoth Swine's base stats. Now, Mammoth Swine certainly is still really well distributed as a strong physically offensive tank, with a respectable base 80 speed when combined with its bulk. But with even another 20 in any of its stats, you could probably make this an absolute nightmare while still being below average for a late game base stat total. I know that's kind of a nitpick, but when we compare to our number one entry, that does have a similar viability in the role that it plays. It's definitely, I think, a fair reason to keep Mammoth Swine at number two. Now onto some honorable mentions. There were a lot of candidates for our list today. However, I want to highlight two honorable mentions that just missed out on our list. The first is Hydreigon, which is a very terrifying dark and dragon type. Hydreigon easily was strong enough to make the list today. However, I ended up not ranking it due to its impossibly high evolution level of 64, one of the highest of all time. Hydreigon is lucky to evolve before you'd even fight the champion in most games, so that's pretty much why I disqualified it from our rankings today. The other honorable mention is another strong dragon that just shared too much with other entries to stand out, being Dragonite. I did consider Dragonite as an option for number 10, but when looking at the games and the other options available, Dragonite just falls short compared to Milotic, which is a much more unique option for your team in the late game as a strong water option. Having another dragon doesn't make much sense when you could just choose one of our other higher ranked dragons such as Salamence or even our number one entry. Now, for our number one entry, we have a Pokemon I have thrown through the mud for generations on these in-game lists. I probably have a reputation at this point for thinking this Pokemon is a waste of time to acquire due to how late you obtain its evolution. However, our list today was practically made for our first place entry, Garchomp. Congratulations, you're incredible. Now, I do need to preface that typically you'll have a lot of ground types you can obtain earlier on for important gym battles and other bosses, but Garchomp still provides plenty of benefits if we are strictly talking about late game encounters that do make it a truly standout Pokemon. For starters, Garchomp has an impressive 130 attack stat, which, similar to Mamoswine, allows it to shine as a wall breaker with ease. However, we do see a few additions that make this a standout option compared to the Mammoth, with the first being a speed stat of 102. Remember earlier when I mentioned with just an extra 20 in its stat total, Mammoth Swine could be a monster? This was why. Garchomp is basically Mammoth Swine if it had that 20 extra speed, which would usually be enough to be nearly unbeatable when you factor in the random EVs and speed you probably picked up evolving Garchomp by accident. Garchomp also has one other key benefit over Mammoth Swine, being Swords Dance, turning moves like Earthquake and Outrage into one-hit KO moves against most other Pokemon. Similar to Mammoth Swine, we also get a lot of benefits from the ground type here to help out our dragon type that may otherwise be a mixed bag into later bosses. While your dragon typing helps a lot against other dragons, the ground type stab gives you an edge against steel types, which typically were the best checks to dragons until fairies came around. Most fairies aren't going to appreciate taking a swords dance boosted earthquake though, and most won't outspeed you either, since they're typically tanky special based Pokemon. Your one big weakness is definitely ice type still, which I won't lie, does hurt a bit seeing as it's a common late game typing. However, if they lack ice shard, they'll at least need to take powerful moves like rock slide, stone edge, fire blast, fire fang, Iron Head, and so many others since the type is weak to a million other typings that Garchomp has coverage for. Overall, I definitely have given Garchomp quite a bit of flack in the past, but I'm glad, as of recent, I finally made a best mon list that Garchomp can comfortably achieve number one on. So congrats to the Land Shark. Well, that pretty much wraps up our list for the best in-game Pokemon across the franchise. 
What Pokemon were the most surprising for you guys to see on my list today? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. Also, be on the lookout for the top 10 best early game Pokemon. That's going to be coming pretty soon. So with that, I'll see you guys in a bit.